Hello, and welcome to the United Nations Oceans Conference virtual side event, Seaweed, Aquatic Food Solutions for People, Climate and Oceans. This side event is jointly organized by Silit Agricultural University in Bangladesh and Worldfish, and is supported by WWF International and the Safe Seaweed Coalition. This is one of the many side events organized under the UN Oceans Conference happening now in Lisbon with the theme of scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of goal 14, stock taking, partnerships and solutions. My name is Julie Llewellyn and I'm the Deputy Oceans Leader at WF International and I'll be moderating this event. Today, we are very fortunate to be joined by experts from several geographical regions active in seaweed culture and production as well as a team currently on the ground in Lisbon, Portugal. We already have more than 100 people in the room and our administrators are still admitting more people from the lobby. While we wait for more of you to join us, allow me to quickly direct your attention to a few housekeeping rules that are showing up on your screens right now. Please do take a moment to read these through. So attendees, cameras and microphones will be switched off by default. This event is being recorded and screenshots will be taken for promotional purposes. Please do look for the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen and use that to submit questions. There's also a comments box. So please um, feel free to put comments into that chat box. We will also be sharing links related to content, relating to content in the chat box during the discussions. So do look out and check for those links. And after the event finishes, we will, we will be sharing the event recording and other post event materials via Worldfish's excellent newsletter. Please do make sure you sign up now to the newsletter so you don't miss an update. So an important theme that emerged from the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021 and the Glasgow COP26 meeting is the importance of the inclusion of aquatic foods in the food systems transformation agenda as we move towards achieving the sustainable development goals and in particular, as we move towards goal two, zero hunger and goal 14, life below water. There is also a growing recognition of the potential opportunities of, harvest, of harnessing aquatic foods as nature-based solutions to address climate risks. And this is supported by scientific evidence and data, including the papers presented by the Blue Food Assessment. Seaweed or macroalgae are a diverse range of low trophic and high biomass aquatic foods that are touted for their ability to provide multiple micronutrients and essential fatty acids in diets, as well as serving as important carbon sequestration agents and carbon sinks for the ocean. Seaweed cultivation is deemed a net zero production solution requiring no inputs to production and is slowly making waves in its ability to meet food and nutrition security of nations, generate income, provide livelihood opportunities for coastal communities, as well as provide platforms for social inclusion especially for women, youth, and indigenous communities into the aquatic food systems. Today's event will draw upon the knowledge and expertise of global, regional, and local stakeholders to share their thoughts and to position seaweed as an innovative solution for nourishing people and the planet. At the end of the event, we hope to identify solutions and opportunities that can advance seaweed accessibility and availability to more communities, especially the poor and vulnerable groups across the world. So without further ado, allow me to invite the co-organizer of this side event, Dr. Kunda, Dean of the Faculty of Fisheries and Professor in the Department of Aquatic Resource Management in Silat Agricultural University in Bangladesh to the virtual floor for his opening remarks. Dr. Kunda, over to you. Thank you, Julie. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. It is my pleasure to welcome you all 
to the United Nations Ocean Conference, virtual side event, seaweed, aquatic food solution for people, climate, and ocean. This event is jointly organized by Silat Agricultural University and Wallfish and supported by our partners, WWF International and Safe Seaweed Coalition. An important theme that had emerged from the United Nations Food Systems Summit 2021 and further recognized in the Glasgow COP26 meeting in the, is the importance of aquatic food in the food systems transformation agenda as we move towards achieving zero hunger and as nature-based solution to address climate risk. Aquatic foods and compassing charm to include diverse plants, animal and microorganism organ originating from various aquatic resources uh, are consumed by up to 3 billion people globally and provide livelihood for up to 800 uh, million people around the world, especially in low and middle income countries. Seaweed are very simple, macroscopic, multicellular marine algae that neglect true roots, stems, flowers, and leaves, and are vital to marine aquatic environment. They generally live attached to rock or other substrate. The high water mark up to a depth of 118 meter, uh, where 0.1% photosynthetic light is available in the ocean and other water bodies. Seaweed provides a diverse source of uh, raw materials for manufacturing of costumes, cosmetics, fertilizers, and extraction of industrial gums and chemicals, which have wide application in the food, pharmaceuticals, and industrial sectors. As low trophic and high biomass aquatic, aquatic food, seaweed is the first gaining recognition in its role to provide multiple micronutrients and essential fatty acids in diets, as well as an important carbon sequestration agent and carbon sink for the ocean. Seaweed features strongly in diets in East and Southeast Asia the Pacific and coastal communities and is gaining popularly worldwide. As the demand of seaweed grows, so are now production regions, including Bangladesh. The natural profusion of seaweed is recorded in Bangladesh from southeastern part and the natural growth of the seaweed in St. Martin's Island is huge. There are 138 seaweed species containing 18 commercially vi viable species having, having a place of 55 genera are found within the coastal area of Bangladesh. These uses of seaweed are finding new applications in the food industry for both human and animal consumption. Food and beverage companies are also using seaweed in the innovative products. The trend provides opportunities for seaweed producers in developing countries like Bangladesh seek to develop the next generation of smart protein food from edible seaweeds, which are cost effective, resource efficient, and nutritious. Thus, adding seaweed to food products increases their nutrient density. Seaweed is also benefiting from the increase in demand of plant-based foods. In addition, the European markets offers many opportunities for seaweed producers in developing countries. The European Union imports seaweed mainly from Asia, such as China, Japan, and South Korea. In this regards, Bangladesh may be one of the key players to export the seaweed through the uh, proper supply chain management system and producer to consumer like seaweed certification system with European Union and United States uh, Standard Manual. Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh has paid deep attention to promote the blue economy of blue economy 
seaweed could be one of the vital candidates uh, to contribute in the blue economy of Bangladesh. Today, we are honored to be joined by speakers from several regions across South and Southeast Asia, as well as a delegation representing aquatic foods in Lisbon. This session will draw upon an, the knowledge and expertise of the global experts as they share their thoughts and seaweed innovations in addressing food and nutrition security, livelihood, and ocean health. Importantly, this session will position positive actions that can advance seaweed accessibility and availability to more communities, especially the poor and vulnerable groups across the world. With these few words, I would like to thank you to all joining this UN Ocean Conference side event on seaweed. Over to you, Jilly. Dr. Kunda, thank you so much for those opening remarks. And also thank you to all the participants. I'm seeing people in the chat box from Bangladesh, from Angola, Indonesia, Philippines, Nigeria, Zambia. Please do introduce yourself so we know who we have in the audience. Now, in 2021, uh, Shankuntala Harang Singh Tilstead was announced as the World Food Prize, Food Prize Laureate in recognition of her solutions approach to using aquatic foods to address hunger and malnutrition. Her nutrition sensitive approaches have transformed aquatic food systems in many countries across Asia, Africa, and the Pacific. And now she is a strong advocate to use seaweed to continue nourishing both people and planet. Allow me to invite the 2021 World Food Prize Laureate as well as the global lead for nutrition and public health at Worldfish to share her address on aquatic food systems in the oceans, synergies in food systems transformation. Shankuntala, over to you. Thank you so much, Jilly. And it's so great to see that we have, we are up to nearly 200 participants in our event. That's amazing. Thank you all for, for, for being part of this. I'll talk a bit on aquatic food systems and the oceans and the synergies in food systems transformation. Leading up to the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, we had two years of deliberations and dialogues all over the world. And with much discussions, it became clear that diverse aquatic foods from diverse waters, marine and inland waters, as well as terrestrial foods and the synergies between land and water systems are integral for the transformation of holistic food systems for nourishing people. And then following on later at COP26, these synergies were further discussed and expanded so that holistic food systems not only can nourish people, but also the planet. And starting with people is important because the people are the stewards of the planet. The oceans and aquatic foods environments are recognized and acknowledged for their importance in en enabling climate mitigation measures, so sorely needed in our world today. Low traffic aquatic foods, and in particular seaweed, were featured prominently in discussions on nature-based solutions for addressing the challenges of the climate crises and at the same time being a highly nutritious food, superfoods, bountiful in multiple nutrients, including minerals, vitamins, and essential fatty acids, so very important for growth, development, and cognition of young children. Discussions went further not only considering the foods and the food systems from land and water, but also taking into consideration a people-centered approach and the different actors throughout the holistic food system, consumers, supply chain actors, producers, 
and those who support all aspects of the food systems. For example, transport, service providers in food markets and food stores, as well as policy makers, and the interdependence of these different groups. So it is evident that a rather complex set of synergies that include food systems, land and water systems, and people are needed to ensure healthy people and also a healthy planet. We are well aware that land and water systems are interlinked and that, for example, the use of fertilizers and pesticides on land can disrupt healthy water systems and the integrity of corals, seagrass beds and mangroves destroying the very fundament for fisheries and small scale fisher folk, their lives and their livelihoods. However, with the inclusion of seaweed on the plate, in diets and in production, we can promote synergies in holistic food systems to nourish both people and our planet. To further illustrate this, our panelists in this event from different countries will share with us their research and field experience on the benefits of seaweed for nourishing people and our planet. We look forward to learn and to take action based on your experiences. Thank you so much, Jilly, and back to you. Thank you so much, Shankuntala. Uh, our next speaker, earlier this year, launched a book entitled La Révolution des Algues, Positioning the Use of Seaweed to Mobilize a Global Revolution for Sustainable, Healthy, and Climate Equitable Diets. His book was very well received in many countries, including France, Switzerland, Canada, and Belgium, and has drawn lots of positive attention towards the growing potential of seaweed, as well as spurring interest to scale up the industry in a safe and sustainable way. Now I invite Vincent Dumezel, Senior Advisor for Oceans at the United Nations Global Compact and the Director of the Food Program at the Lloyd's Register Foundation to present his global perspective on seaweed. Vincent, over to you. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations for, to everyone for, uh, for this great session. Um, I'm in Lisbon right now and I can tell you that there's a real momentum in seaweed. I gave uh, five presentations yesterday uh, <laughs> in a very different place, so, so very good and um, I think we are on the right track. So yeah, and, and just to precise, uh, just to, uh, to, to, to tell everyone, the book will be uh, translated in English and Spanish and Chinese and uh, released uh, early 2023. So you should all uh, enjoy it uh, very soon. Um, so what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to uh, to show you is what we are doing because I think uh, we are in a world uh, we, we know are in a moment in a moment that require actions and uh, we need to get together to do these actions otherwise it 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 won't it won't be enough. I mean the, the book is called the Seaweed Revolution because our, 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 our because it's a collective book and it's, I'm I'm just I'm just messaging that I'm I'm not the voice but. Uh, our thinking is that we, we moved from a, a, a revolution back 12,000 years ago when we stopped being hunters, gatherers and became farmers on land, but we are still uh, in the Stone Age when it comes to the ocean. We are, we are still yet to develop and, and, and farm the lowest trophic level as indicated before. And, uh, and we need to do that revolution, you need to do that green revolution in the ocean, um, which is, and we need to do it fast. Um, and I think that that revolution has a lot of uh, potential. So we'll go for the next slide and see why the United Nations that I'm part of uh, is so interested into that because uh, seaweed is ticking a lot of boxes when it comes to the, um, to the SDGs. And first and foremost, I'd like to say uh, that I, uh, this, this, all this revolution and this, com uh, and this uh, cause is, is really a, a call for optimism and hopes. I think uh, we are feeding the next generation uh, with a lot of fears and drama about the future, about what it can be. And of course, in, 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 at some point, it's, it's right, and we have to go for more carbon austerity and so forth. Uh, but I like to feed them with something else, that drama and, and fears, and maybe feed them with solutions and hopes. And I think we own that to that, that new next generation. So seaweed 
is a great solution. It uh, offers many solutions. First of all, I'd like to say that seaweed can be very diverse. There are 12,000 types of seaweed, which are very, very different. I often say that uh, uh, a green seaweed is far more different from a genetic point of view to a, uh, um, a green seaweed is far more different to a red seaweed than a fungi is to a, an elephant. So that's that's quite a wide range of organism, as you can guess. Uh, and, and that offers an equally wide range of applications. So, um, I mean, you cannot say seaweed is this. Seaweed are a very, very uh, various uh, type of uh, organism. So first of all, seaweed as a sustainable food source for human consumption. And we know that uh, it's, very, it's very powerful. In Japan, it makes up 10% of the food already, uh, and it's highly linked uh, to, uh, to this very long uh, life expectancy and the very low level of uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, uh, and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and cancer as well. So that's a very sustainable source food. And what is good as well uh, for emerging countries uh, is that you don't need cold chain. I mean, the seaweed keeps all the nutrients. Uh, even when you dry it, it will keep all the good things, the iron, the protein, the zinc, and, and all the, this nutritional bomb can content will, keep, will stay there if you dry them, which means that you can transport them for months uh, with no need for any cold chain, which is very good for our people and our climate. So once again, it's a very good sustainable source uh, of food. Um, it is cleaning the ocean clearly, but it's not only a source of food, it's only a source of feed. As we mentioned, we know that seaweed as a source of feed can provide a lot of positive side benefit to animal. Uh, um, it can replace fertilizers, as it was said before, which is, I mean, that's the biggest interest for a company like Nestle when it comes to seaweed is to replace fertilizers. Uh, it can, uh, I have here with me, can replace plastic. I have here with me some uh, plastic, some uh, bubble that are made out of seaweed. I don't know if you see them. Uh, that's a sachet of seaweed. In fact, it's an, it's compostable, biodegradable, and edible. So I could eat the sachet. It's eight o'clock in the morning, so I'm not going to eat a sachet of olive oil, but uh, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's really a, a good solution. Can replace cotton, can replace, it can really uh, support life below water. Uh, it can pro provide a new source of innovation for medicines and beyond. And it can absorb a lot of greenhouse gas. Seaweed can grow up to 40 centimeters a day, uh, some of them, up to 60 meters high. So they can grow very big uh, and absorb a lot of carbon. We know already that, that wild seaweed absorbs just as much carbon as the entire Amazon forest. And we have to bear in mind that it's disappearing much faster. So we have to preserve seaweed. But the good thing with seaweed is that when you, when you lose a, a land forest, it will take 20 years to grow again. A seaweed forest will take three months to grow again, to grow back to 60 meters high because it grows so fast. So, and all the life around it will come back as well. And, and last but certainly not least, because when you lead a revolution, uh, the biggest of your concern should be to decrease social injustice. Uh, seaweed brings new source of revenues and jobs in coastal community, notably to women. So it, it further uh, women empowerment and gender equity uh, because we see that in most of the developing countries where we establish seaweed, like in Tanzania, in Philippines, uh, a large part of the revenues and jobs goes to women. So that's a very positive uh, thing. So you would say, well, it's a dream; it will, it cannot exist. Well, next next slide, we will see that it's already existing. The seaweed revolution has started in North Asia for 50 years. Seaweed cultivation has started. As you can see, the dark green uh, is, the, uh, is, the, uh, is the evolution of the seaweed cultivation. So you see, it has really started very big. Uh, the seaweed harvest, I mean, wild collection has remained the same, but the seaweed cultivation has started 50 years ago or, or, or so, uh, only in Asia. I mean, 99% uh, of the production of seaweed is in Asia. Why? Why only one country in North Asia, I would say, um, why only one part of a region in the world uh, is using a, a resource that do not need land, do not need pesticide, is quite unlikely to fly away or swim away, and, and, uh, and, uh, and no need to say that you do not, you do need, do not need to water seaweed. So, uh, so that no, no fresh water. And, and by the way, when you squeeze seaweed, what you get out of it is uh, uh, fresh water. So it's a great, great uh, source of solution for everything. It's growing fast. It's there already. We have to implement this revolution in other country, no, not only in Asia. Uh, and Asia started 50 years ago because of demographic constraints, clearly. Next slide. In order to voice that 
that potential and to bring everyone together. What we did two years ago was to launch the Seaweed Manifesto. So we took all these big uh, people here, FAO, Nestle, Metro, WWF, Cargill, and we wrote the Seaweed Manifesto, uh, which was, you can, you can see seaweedmanifesto.com, you can download it here, uh, in order to highlight the potential and highlight also the obstacles and, and, the, and the call for actions. Out of this, because one of our main conclusion was that the seaweed space was very, very fragmented. There are a lot of, except in Asia, uh, there's a lot of uh, pioneers, but they do not cooperate. They do not work together. So it's a lot of overlap, a lot of redundancies. So our, 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 um, um, our call to action was really to create a coalition to, to, to get these people together so we can accelerate change and attract investors. Um, uh, and, and that's why we did create the Safe Seaweed Coalition, which is the first global platform for seaweed stakeholder. It has been fully funded by the Lloyd Register Foundation that you can see here so far, but we will have uh, other funding and, and, and supported and, and due to next year, it will be hosted in, uh, in the, uh, by the United Nations uh, Global Compact. So next slide. And uh, we will have tomorrow that our global governance. As you can see, that there's a lot of people uh, in this uh, in this uh, governance. So they, they are the steering committee and the advisory board. Uh, we have we have built uh, next slide. Um, we have built uh, we have a wide representation as you can see here. We have been a, a, a global mapping of the CV stakeholders. So we have over 800 members in the in the in the platform in the in the in the coalition now, and uh, all of them are mapped. In this, well, uh, that's not an updated one. There are much more now, but um, but you see that you have some dots here, and you can click on the dots and see who is doing what and where uh, on seaweed. So it's a great way to map. If you are an investor, you can understand who is doing what and who, who I want to invest in. Uh, if you are a buyer, you can find out who is doing what. If you are uh, 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 clearly, we need to uh, uh, shed a light on this supply chain. We have a huge number of uh, of, uh, of stakeholders, and tomorrow. We will have our first annual meeting, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, all the people here are, are kindly invited. It's absolutely free. It's in Lisbon City Center. Shakuntala will speak there, um, and and we will have our uh, our first uh, annual meeting, gathering around 200 of our stakeholders uh, coming from all over the world in Lisbon, taking advantage of this uh, of this uh, uh, conference. So once again, the idea is to create a seaweed community, to create a seaweed family so we can work together and be much more efficient and much faster uh, in terms of uh, change. We are 12,000 years late uh, compared to the land production, so we have to catch up very efficiently and very quickly. Next slide, please. So typically, what we do is not only to bring to bring to life a community, but we are also giving money. We receive five million pounds uh, from the from the uh, from the Royal Register Foundation. Eighty percent of this money is to support project. So last year, for instance, here is a list of projects that we have supported. We gave around fifty or sixty thousand uh, uh, dollars to each of these projects. Uh, we had a co-proposal. Uh, and and uh, and we uh, uh, and, are, and and we allocated this uh, money to all these different projects, and we are really creating a court of uh, of uh, of, uh, of grantees. Uh, we have another ten that will be announced on tomorrow. I mean, during the annual meeting, uh, so we have another ten uh, uh, awardees uh, that have uh, that will be um, supported, uh, and we will have another ten by the end of this year. So, um, if you want to join. Uh, feel free if you have some project to be funded. Uh, you are absolutely fine to uh, to, ra to raise a co to raise a proposal. Uh, we will issue the next core proposal around September or so, and we will have another one next year. And we are knowing to um, the, the support from the foundation ends up at the end of 2023 normally, but uh, we are quite likely to uh, continue this uh, uh, over uh, over the upcoming years. Trying to support innovative projects, we work mostly in the in the in the in the safety world, uh, um, safety for the product uh, to improve safety for the product for the seaweed product to improve safety for the environmental product, uh, make sure that seaweed does not harm the environment when you grow it, and uh, also working for the occupational safety, uh, making sure that these people working in the seaweed industry uh, they are safe. I mean, uh, and and they are not at risk. We mentioned that a lot of women were working there. We know also that. Because of global warming, we have to go deeper and deeper in shallow water to grow seaweed. These, most of these women in Tanzania, they cannot swim, they cannot drive a boat, so we need to train them. We need to make sure that they have the right 
um, regulations in place. Why safety? Why do we focus on safety? Because safety is a pre-competitive topic. We don't want this coalition to be into competitive space. Uh, otherwise, people will be uh, reluctant to collaborate. We want to work on something that is absolutely non-competitive. Safety is absolutely not competitive. You are happy to share everything. So we start to work on safety topics and everything we found will be uh, related to safety. So next slide, I think I'm at the end anyway. So um, that's it, that's a safe coalition. Uh, feel free to join it. Uh, we are uh, really trying to voice the message everywhere. Uh, to uh, to tell the positive uh, uh, benefit from uh, from from seaweed, and uh, we are now working with FAO, working with the Jeff, working with uh, the UNEP, and so forth. So we have a real good uh, momentum, uh, and and all together, it's really a bottom up organization. We want it to be driven by our members. We want all of you to drive this organization and to tell us what to do with this tool, with this forum. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's really something to be done for the benefit of the seaweed industry. And, and we hope that we will be remembered as the first generation on this planet that managed to feed the entire world, the entire population of this world with safe and sustainable food. And I, I, think, I think we will be able to do it, because, but it will have to be all together. Thank you. And San, thank you so much for those powerful words. And it's so exciting to be here as part of the, the seaweed family as part of the seaweed revolution. And I see we have almost uh, 250 people joined. Um, Yay, congratulations. <laughs> it's a nice reminder also, everybody needs to sign up for the World Fish newsletter because that's where we will be sharing details of this next call for proposals. So you're, if you're interested in, in applying for those proposals, um, join up to the World Fish newsletter. Um, so as Shankuntala and, and Vansan's presentations have clearly outlined, um, there's a huge potential for using seaweed as a means to address global hunger, which is now exacerbated by climate conflict and COVID-19, as well as using uh, seaweed as a, as a means to restore our ecosystems and our ocean health. Moving on from these excellent opening remarks and presentations, we will now hear from a panel of experts from East and Southeast Asia on how they harness the potential of seaweed in a more localized context. We will be listening to their experiences in using seaweed to provide food and nutrition security, to generate income and livelihoods, to promote social inclusion and build resilience against the impacts of climate change. These speakers will briefly share with us their field experience and research and the impacts of seaweed cultivation, processing and consumption in the communities that they work with. Then we've also asked them to share with us a desired intervention or change that will help advance the growing potential of seaweed cultivation for the community and for the region. And while we listen to our speakers, please feel free to type your questions for them into the Q&A box. And thank you, we've already got a couple of great questions come in. Let's add and see if we can get a few more questions as the presenters make their presentations. So the first speaker I will invite is Dr. Assad, Associate Professor at Chattagram Veterinary and Animal Sciences University in Bangladesh, uh, to speak on the cultivation of seaweed in Cox's Bazaar and how seaweed is used to enhance the food and nutrition security of the community there. Dr. Assad, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Gilly, for giving me uh, this nice opportunity. Actually, you know, my presentation or my discussion will consist of three parts. At first, I will give you some introduction and then how we are actually uh, producing seaweed, our approach by the EcoFish project of the World Fish. And lastly, uh, I will tell something about how this seaweed farming can contribute to the food and nutritional security for the Bangladesh people. So actually already previous two uh, presenter uh, shows various advantage of the seaweed. We know the seaweed is actually promising macroalgae for the millennium and providing for social, ecological and economic benefit. As we know, currently worldwide, 48 million square kilometer is under the seaweed culture and more or less 132 nations uh, are included in here. But about 132 nations 
37 to 44 countries are actually participating for seaweed culture. Uh, as we know that the natural production of seaweeds remain stagnant of the last decade to about 1.1 million tons. But the aquaculture production of seaweed is drastically increasing and now production is more than 35 million tons. So what about the situation for Bangladesh? You know, like last few years before in 2014, our government has settled the maritime boundaries of Bangladesh with Myanmar and India. So, and which give us about the 80% of our mainland area in the marine area. So Bangladesh have about 480 kilometer coastline, but actually still now seaweed aquaculture, we can say it is still in the initial stage. Various organization is actually doing some research experiment on the seaweed cultivation, but still uh, there are some socioeconomic and technological constraints. So based on this, actually the EcoFish of the USAID funded project of the World Fish consider the seaweed farming in Bangladesh by participatory approach, not like research approach. So uh, in this case, and I am the Dr. Asadud Jaman actually taking care of this part of the seaweed project on behalf of the EcoFish project. So actually for seaweed farming in Bangladesh, we have two approaches. One is in this slide, you are saying the providing training to the coastal communities, because you know, our coastal communities is most of them, they are uh, illiterate, their education background is not so high and they are very poor. So in our aspect, so actually we give them two to three days, very intensive training to culture of the seaweed. Here you can see that like our efforts for seaweed farming. So uh, last two years, we actually provided training for 400 fishermen, among who is a great percentage are the women. So that means our first approach is providing training to the coastal communities. So next slide, please. So then, you know, actually our coastal people is very poor. They don't have money to culture the seaweed by their own investment. So EcoFish project, uh, actually, you know, we provide them all the input assistance, but they provide, they give their labor, they give their workforce and they take care of the culture. Here you can see like how we give the basic materials to our like the coastal communities, poor coastal communities. So that means we are giving them training, we are giving them input assistance. So after that, they actually go for the culture. So next slide, please. So at present, actually, you know, our uh, seaweed culture, we are considering actually actively producing four species in the, like our coastal, uh, coastal area. Here you can see like the Gracilera species, actually it gives very huge uh, production. And actually, you know, this species is very uh, like ready species and it's very high agar content. And here you can see like uh, farmer are producing by a uh, different approaches like off bottom, long line culture, off bottom, net culture. And we recently developed like a uh, floating culture because off bottom, long line and off bottom net culture is area limited. So next slide, please. So, so moreover, we are also producing like Ulva species and like Entromorpha species. These two are the uh, green seaweed species. Uh, so next slide, please. So actually, you know, from this year, actually the seaweed uh, aquaculture in Bangladesh is primarily constrained due to the lack of proper area because the land-based system area is not so high. So then we focus on the uh, like developing the floating culture technique by using the locally available cheap resources. So uh, we designed this floating culture and actually it give us tremendous result. Like the production is very high, quality is very high and our farmer become uh, like, you know, they socioeconomically uh, very much benefited. So now after developing this promising technology, now we are very much hopeful for the boom production of seaweed in Bangladesh. Uh, next slide, please. So as you uh, say, like our approach is like provide the livelihood opportunities, because I told you like the our most of the 
farmer are the poor they don't have alternative income generating activities and like our women they remain in the home and primarily depend on their husband income so we are trying to use this workforce in the ecofish project so about 400 beneficiaries last two years 242 are women that means the 60 percent women and here in the sum photograph you can show like the women actually involve actively involve themselves in seaweed preparation seaweed cultivation seaweed production and after production you know the, they divide the each seaweed by themselves through equal like division and even some of this seaweed because you know the our tribal communities they regularly consume seaweed so in the last picture you can see like the our beneficiaries they are going to the market and sell this seaweed for the earning money so next seaweed next next slide please so beside the women actually you know our target is to uh, make the entrepreneurship support for the unemployed youth because in the coastal area there are many youth people they don't have any job and they are little educated so they don't want to go to the catching fish with their parents so we this uh, like from the last year we have targeted to this youth so that we can bring this youth for the seaweed cultivation and seaweed marketing so we bring this youth for the culture of the seaweeds and then they can grow it as a business like a small business and they grow they harvest even they sell the package so this is also our target to develop like unemployed youth for the seaweed farming in uh, Bangladesh so next slide please so after this actually you know uh, seaweed is a new food item in Bangladesh uh, tribal people they regularly consume seaweed most of the seaweeds are uh, selling them uh, but uh, uh, actually you know now we need to promote this seaweed in the mainstream food so last two months before actually our ecofish project uh, uh, organized a very good uh, blue food festival where we produce more than 100 seaweed uh, food items uh, like to promote this sea, uh, seafood uh, like seaweed based food to our local consumer or like local people uh, it was a very fantastic and wonderful uh, event so that's uh, like some of the snapshot of our ecofish project activity but now I, I can little show you like how this seaweed can uh, like uh, attract the nutritional security as you know, the seaweed contains 5 to 47 percent of the protein. And among this protein, 42 to 48 percent are essential amino acids. So, and again, the seaweed are the good source of fatty acid that we show because we analyze the seaweed uh, like lipid content is low, less than 5 percent. But interestingly, 50 percent of the seaweed fat is the polyunsaturated fatty acid. But why I'm thinking like seaweed is the most benefited for the nutrient like mineral content for Bangladesh because you know Bangladesh people facing a lot of iodine problem. But seaweed contains amazing amount of iodine. It contains thousand times more iodine than most of the seafood, for example, the cod. And also it is a great source of minerals and other macronutrient. So, for, uh, so if we can bring this seaweed in our partial amount of in our daily food like then i think it will be great uh, source for the malnutrition of our like pregnant women of the young children and so on so i hope within very short time seaweed can be a very good industry for bangladesh we are very much hopeful for it thank you gilly and over to you Thank you so much, Dr. Assad. And I do notice that there was a question um, that has already came in about uh, how to use seaweed in Bangladesh and if it is a popular food or medicine. And I think you have helped answer that question through your presentation. So thank you for that. Um, our second panelist uh, is Jakia Hassan, Senior Scientific Officer with the Bangladesh Fisheries Research Institute. Jackia will give us examples from Bangladesh on how seaweed cultivation has improved livelihoods in the communities, and as well as her desired intervention to scale up the impacts of her work. Jackia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie, for giving me the space for the presentation. Last slide. 
Seaweed naturally occurred in Bangladesh coast of the Bay of Bengal, which is consumed by the tribal people and goes to neighboring countries. No culture practices before 2014. After that, BFRI initiated the seaweed culture in Bangladesh firstly. After that, government takes some steps for the initiatives about commercialization of seaweed. Second slide, please. Till now, 148 species identified of which 28 have commercial value. Now, six species of seaweed under culture, as well as processing and marketing also developed. Most popular are red sweet that is available. Next slide, please. No systematic processing of seaweed was exist before. Now popular people are aware about nutritional value of seaweed. Women are actively involved in seaweed harvesting, processing, and marketing. NGO and developmental workers are helping to promote seaweed farming in Bangladesh. It is very easy and safety technology for rural women. The women employment is growth is increased day by day. Next slide. Government running developmental project to strengthen seaweed research and development. Seaweed lab for processing and value addition has been established. Government priorities seaweed to achieve SDG and blue economy concept. Women entrepreneurship has been developed. The women employment growth is increased day by day, about 60% rate increased last year for women. It will be a good sign for our livelihood. Next slide, please. New technology should be developed to overcome short culture duration and enhance productivity. BFRI also uh, goes to that uh, research that is poor culture. And another is biotechnology would be a good option for uh, the option of uh, employment. Mapping of seaweed farming area is very much necessary for the culture activities. Seaweed culture and processing would be a livelihood option for fisheries and their family members. Thank you. That's my presentation. Thank you very much, Jackie, and I, I really appreciate uh, the detail in the presentation from both of our presenters from Bangladesh. And I'm very pleased to see how many participants we also have from Bangladesh. So it, it really is an exciting opportunity to build on the work that's happening there. Now, our third panelist for today is Professor Jang Kim, Associate Professor in the Department of Marine Sciences, Incheon National University in South Korea. Professor Kim will share with us examples of his work to harness the potential of seaweed to build climate resilience in communities, uh, as well as sharing with us what you would see as your one desired intervention that could really help scale up your work. Jang, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jelly. Uh, as many of you, oh, uh, the slide, please. As many of you, if not all, agree, climate change is real. To achieve the global goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, it is extremely important to not only reduce the carbon emissions, but also remove carbon dioxide from the environment. The blue carbon has received recognition as a great source for carbon remover due to its ability to absorb carbon from the marine ecosystem. As one of the major blue carbon sources, seaweed has recently received the spotlight as a powerful ocean-based climate solution. Next slide, please. The biggest limitation of seaweed as a tool for carbon sequestration boils down to its short lifespan. It ranges from a couple of weeks to years, which is too brief for it, to be, for, for it to become a carbon sink. However, recent studies have shown that 
seaweed can play an important role for climate resilience, mostly due to the seaweed derived organic carbon stored in sediment, as well as the environmentally friendly seaweed biomass applications. I am going to go over some important applications of seaweed for climate resilience today. Next slide, please. South Korea is one of the first countries evaluating potential carbon dioxide remover called CDR by the wild population of seaweed. This research was conducted starting in 2006 for nearly a decade. A recent study also estimated that the global seaweed forest is over 7 million uh, square meter, kilometers, which can remove nearly 1.3 kilogram of carbon per year. They also estimated that the wild population of seaweed can sequester as much carbon as seagrass, mangrove, and salt marshes combined. One big issue with the seaweed forest is that globally, the seaweed population has been significantly declining. This has also been a major issue in Korea. So Korea, the Korea Fisheries Resources Agency called FIRA has conducted marine forest restoration projects for over 20 years and over 20,000 hectares of seaweed forest have been restored nationwide as of 2020. This agency plans to restore 54,000 hectares of the seaweed forest by 2030. These restored forests and nearby sediments are currently being evaluated for its carbon sequestration potential. My research team is also interested in carbon sequestration of natural beds of seaweed. Specifically, we are currently evaluating the potential carbon sequestration of seaweed blooms in mud flats. We measure the carbon remover by the seaweed and the sediment, we also analyze eDNA to estimate the direct contribution to the organic carbon in soil from the blooms. Next slide, please. The seaweed biomass from farms should also remove a significant amount of carbon dioxide. According to recent studies, the global seaweed aquaculture can remove nearly 3 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. In Korea, the amount of carbon dioxide remover was over 160,000 tons per year, which is approximately 6% of carbon dioxide discharged from all wastewater treatment plants in Korea. However, the problem again, is the short lifespan. Therefore, the research has mostly been focusing on the sediment under the seaweed farms. Dr. Carlos Duarte and his colleagues must receive credit for this new innovation. Oceans 2050 has conducted a global seaweed project and has quantified carbon sequestration through seaweed aquaculture by measuring the carbon contents in soil under the seaweed farms. 21 seaweed farms around the world have participated in this project, including the seaweed farms in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Korea. Duarte reported that up to three gigatons of carbon dioxide can be sequestered below the farms per year. These results were presented at an event earlier this year. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit the YouTube link on this slide. Next slide, please. There are also other studies looking at potential roles of seaweed for climate resilience. One proposal is farming seaweed in the offshore environment and sinking the biomass into the deep ocean. Additional research has also suggested that the pelagic seaweed blooms, such as sargassum blooms, may be sunk in deep ocean. Other recent studies showed that over 80% of methane can be reduced by adding a tiny bit of a certain seaweed called asparagopsis to luminant feed. Uh, 
However, there is a ch big challenge to grow this red alga asparagopsis on a large scale and or to find alternative species with quality efficiency for methane reduction. WWF has been a big supporter for this effort. I think I have covered important applications of seaweed for climate resilience as much as I can in five minutes. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask during the Q&A session today or contact me via email. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jilly. Thank you so much, Yang. That's a great presentation and a really nice compliment looking at the climate resilience um, potential uh, to the previous speakers. So our fourth speaker of the day is Ibu Artati, director, the Director General of Product Competitiveness in the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries with the Republic of Indonesia. Ibu Artati will share with us the contributions of seaweed to the Indonesian economy as well as the impacts of seaweed, uh, as well as the impacts uh, of seaweed production uh, and the engagement of processes across Indonesia. Uh, we are also keen to hear from Ibu Atati what her one desired intervention would be to strengthen the contribution of seaweed to the local as well as the national economy. Ibu Atati, over to you. Thank you, Jili. Good morning, everybody. It is a great honor for me to be here discussing about seaweed, a magical living industrial crop. I believe that this commodity will be very important in the near future. As described by previous speakers, seaweed is fantastic. So let me now share about Indonesian seaweed. The production uh, of seaweed in Indonesia is around 9.6 million uh, wet ton, wet seaweed uh, ton. That is the annual production. And um, this product uh, has been traded internationally in the form of uh, dried seaweed, karaginan, and also agar. The average value of Indonesian export during 2017 to 2021 was around uh, 292 million US dollar or about 12% uh, of the world seaweed export value. In the last five years, seaweed contributed 5.70% to the value of Indonesian fisheries export in general. Indonesian uh, export of seaweed mainly to China, USA, UK, and Japan. In terms of type, uh, Gracilari and Yukema are produced along the coastline, including South Sulawesi, Central uh, Sulawesi, South Sulawesi, East Nusantara, mostly in the eastern part of Indonesia, but also in Kalimantan Island or Borneo and some in West Java Island. Involving more than 2006, uh, excuse me, 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 267,000 coastal household, sorry, depending their livelihood on civic production. In terms of income, uh, income from civic, I mean, from uh, for coastal communities is fried among the region. It, depending, it depends on the economic scale, quality of production, and also the access for transportation because some of the uh, seaweed, uh, seaweed uh, farming is located in the remote areas. What about the impact of seaweed producers and processors across the Indonesia? Right now, there are at least uh, 36 processing plants uh, which is an industry, industrial scale uh, operated in Indonesia, which majority exists in Java Island, South Sulawesi, and also, um, yeah, uh, Java Island and uh, Sulawesi. And uh, the most uh, production are in the form of uh, alkali treated uh, spinosum, alkali treated uh, cottony, semi refined karaginan, 
refined carrageenan and also agar. Meanwhile, the SME produce seaweed-based food and also beef fridges and also sea vegetables. If we are talking about the derivative products uh, about seaweed, there are so many uh, so many production and uh, I I think that the the derivative product itself is unlimited and very wide usage. From feed, fertilizer, hydrocolloids, biostimulant, biomaterial, cosmetic, pharmacy, and etc. It means that the money is there. This is indicated by the fast growing demand of seaweed in the global market. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay. Um, Seaweed in Indonesia is uh, one of the priorities commodities in the Ministry of Marine Affairs and uh, Fisheries. And um, we are, uh, the, the contribution of seaweed to the local as well as national economy. Uh, so many uh, intervention conducted by the government. For instance, we are strengthening Indonesian seaweed brand in the global market, especially for hydrocolloid which is a naturally binding solution to the world. Indonesia is not just a raw material sources country, but also value added product as well. The second uh, intervention from the government is also optimizing the role of Tropical Civic Innovation Network or TSIN, a digital, a digital platform to bridge commercial need with the research. You may uh, see uh, the website in the cvitnetwork.id. What I hope from the uh, global uh, communities, we need a support, supporting global initiative to provide incentive civic farmers for their role in climate change mitigation. This is uh, enlightened by the mangrove uh, role because uh, so many incentive for mangrove uh, growers. So if we uh, we can do the same things for seaweed. I think that is very good uh, to, to provide some intense incentive because of uh, the role of seaweed itself or the climate change. I think that's all for me. Uh, I will now pass back to virtual floor, the virtual floor to Jilly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And it is very exciting to hear that seaweed is one of the priority commodities for the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries in Indonesia. That, that is very exciting. Thank you so much. So our, our fifth and final panelist is recognized for her seaweed research in Malaysia. Having spent more than 20 years working on seaweed and having published more than 160 publications on the subject. Professor Lim is presently the professor and deputy director of the Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences with the University of Malaya. Professor Lim, may I get you to give us some insights on the growing seaweed industry in Malaysia, as well as the challenges faced by these small scale actors in the industry. And if you could also share one desired intervention that might elevate the potential of seaweed for food systems for the communities that you work with. Professor Lim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jelly, for the kind introduction. A very warm greeting to all of you. Warm greeting from Malaysia. It is my pleasure to share with you on the seaweed aquaculture in Malaysia. Malaysia has a long coastal line with more than 408,000 kilometers, and this has provided a natural ecosystem for the growth of seaweed. However, the seaweed aquaculture industry in Malaysia only started in the late 1970s uh, using the traditional approach. With the assistance from the government in 1980s, the seaweed culture industry has grown to commercial scale. As to date, the seaweed aquaculture have, has expanded from Sabah to some part of Peninsula Malaysia, where in Peninsula Malaysia, the species that is cultivated is mainly on uh, Gasiralia and Kalupa, while the commercial species in Malaysia is Kapa, Ficus, and Yokim. As today, 
Sabah is still the largest producer uh, in terms of the volume for seaweed in Malaysia. So for the rest of the talk, I will share and focusing on the seaweed agriculture in Sabah. Next slide, please. So the seaweed aquaculture in Malaysia actually have bring uh, is very important in terms of providing livelihood to the coastal community. So the coast uh, the cultivation have been carried out. Normally for the men, they will do a much more heavy work, while the ladies will help in terms of tying the seaweed at the platform. The seaweeds are using are grow using long line method, and one they are harvested, they are sun dry and well before being sold in the market. Next slide, please. So the harvested seaweed mainly are sold in a dry form, which is going to be used for carrageenan processing. Beside that, the local community also eat seaweed, which they use as a fresh salad as shown in the picture, uh, or local name we call it karabu. At the same time, small portions are being packed as snack foods in dry form that can further process at home to be used for cooking. So next slide, please. So one of the challenges as regard about seaweed industry in Malaysia is the main value change for Malaysia is used for processing carginate. However, there is in, in terms of instability in terms of price, and sometimes the price is very low. Because of that, there is a need for intervention from the government to stabilize the price. Probably there's a need of, uh, to set out the centralized uh, system that will be able to help to stabilize the price. At the same time, we also need to diversify the products. As one of the examples is one of the local company in Sabah, which is Rodomac. This company have come up some innovative product, such as the one in red is actually a quality of leather, as well as plastic, and also growth stimulator. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in the midst of climate change, I think we have uh, heard from Professor Kim that seaweeds aquaculture are not being escaped as well. So, seaweed itself already actually have existing problem, which is have the pests and disease. As you can see in the picture, the white color, white spot, which is what we call ice ice. And then on my right side is the seaweed that have other type of, of epiphytic or other seaweeds that grow. All these will affect in terms of the productivity as well as grow rate. With the increase of our climate change phenomenon, especially temperature increase, this has also caused the occurrence of this pest and disease more frequent. So there's a need to search for a more versatile trait as regards about that is resistant to pests and disease and climate change. Despite that we are having challenges, but I believe with the incorporation of science, which our research group together with the Department of Fishery as well as researcher from UK, we are in the process of searching for new potential strain that can be developed for uh, climate resilience as well as pest and disease resilience. So I believe that with the ability incorporation of science as well as a natural, uh, healthy and large uh, ocean and ecosystem for the growth of seaweeds, I believe this will assist in the growth of the or blooming of the seaweed aquaculture industry in Malaysia. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lim, for sharing uh, an overview of the uh, situation and status with the seaweed industry in Malaysia. We really appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much to all our speakers. The quality of the presentation, the quality of the remarks um, have been extraordinary. I feel very privileged to be part of, of this, uh, this session. Um, and now 
Uh, while we have listened to our speakers share their experience and insights, we've noticed that um, there's been a few questions that have come in to the question and answer box. So this is now the question and answer portion of the, of the, um, of the event. And we would like to invite all of the speakers uh, to turn on your cameras and turn on your microphones. Um, and we're going to have a look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, but first, I have a question, and I would like to ask um, Ibu Atati. Um, the, yeah. the, last, the last two years, there have been many disruptions, um, including with supply chains and, and the movement of products, um, it, including in your role as Director General for Product Com Competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm keen to hear whether you have seen opportunities or challenges because of this, this pattern of global disruption. Thank you, Jilly. It's interesting uh, to talk about the seaweed supply chain during uh, disruption, especially uh, due to the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. I will give you an example in Bali. Bali is a, uh, one of the provinces in Indonesia, which is the economic depends uh, so much in tourism. During pandemic, uh, uh, the tourism collapsed. And uh, luckily, uh, the workers uh, in the tourism sector moved to uh, civic farming. So that's why uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, supply uh, supply chains uh, from uh, seaweed, especially from Bali province, increase. It means that seaweed farming is also the safer for economic during the uh, pandemic, during the uh, disruption. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really interesting to see how the decline of one sector affects, um, provides an opportunity for another sector. Um, yeah. There was a, there was a question um, that came in earlier, and I'm, I'd like to ask um, Prof Lim to answer this one. A question came in on can and should seaweed products be combined with the production of other species, for example, mussels, milkfish, shrimp, or even mangroves? Okay, thank you, Jilly. Okay, so I believe that uh, what the a person that posted the question, when you talk about can seaweed be cultured together with other organisms, probably that's what we normally say is the integrated culture. Yes, the answer is yes. You can mix culture seaweeds with other marine organisms. As, as far as I'm aware, in Malaysia, we are also co-cultivating Gassiralea together with milkfish. So as regards about a possibility about mangrove, I would say that seaweeds is uh, depending on the species. Some of the species actually when you culture at the mangrove area, actually they can grow much better because they are rich nutrient. And also when you talk about combination of uh, cult cultivating seaweeds and other marine organisms, actually it actually will provide a very clean environment because seaweeds are able to remove the nitrogen or discharge from the marine organism and use it as a nutrient for the growing of seaweeds. I hope I answered the question that we asked. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And these are great questions that have been coming into the chat box. Um, now we have a question about whether seaweed farming opposes any negative impacts to ocean life. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, the benefits. Um, but there's a question asking if there are any potential threats and what mitigation is in place. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Professor Yang Kim um, if, you, if you would like to answer that question for us. Okay, so I will do my best to answer for that question. Well, negative impact to ocean life. There, I can think of a couple of things. One is basically in a see, our uh, well, seaweed aquaculture requires the stru ocean structures like long lines, nets, buoys, and anchors, etc. 
and marine animals, especially the endangered marine mammals, may get tangled in the long lines and they got killed. This is actually a major issue in the United States and Europe for uh, having their permits for you know, open water cultivation of seaweed. This is, I would say, like the first you know, the issue that I can think of. And the second issue is that uh, you know, the, the neg another negative impact can be the seaweed aquaculture may can cause some source of blooms. The world's largest seaweed blooms, called ulva blooms, uh, has occurred in the Yellow Sea during the past decade. And these ulva blooms were originated from a seaweed farm called the Neopyropia Farms in Jiangsu Province, China. The natural population of ulva prolifera grow on the seaweed farm structures. And when the seaweeds were harvested, the ulva was detached away from the farm and causing a large scale of <coughs> ulva blooms during the past decade. So I can think of these two major, you know, the imp negative impact to the ocean life and how to mitigate this issue. Well, that's a really difficult question. First, I can for, for the for, you know first first you know uh, the the marine memory issue. I think I mean there have been a lot of studies during the past uh, like three four years to improve the structures of the the seaweed farms in the open water. So that was a part of the the project funded by U.S. Department of Energy. So there have been some. Um, some improvement in terms of the structure and the same structure can be applied to or other countries to improve that uh, the seaweed farms and also for the seaweed source for the seaweed blooms in China it is really important to, to remove these ulva blooms at the beginning at the uh, at the earlier stage from the origin. So there has been some effort, you know, to find out how to remove or reduce these ulva blooms from the origin at, at the seaweed farms in China, as well as in Korea too, because the, the ulva blooms in Korea is also an important, is a really serious issue. So we have also been uh, uh, working to uh, find the ways to use the biomass at the beginning of the, of the bloom stage. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that answer. That was very helpful. Um, now we have a, we had a couple of questions for Vincent about your funding. I think it's always good when you come to the table and announce that there are funding opportunities. <laughs> um, it, the, we've had a question on does your funding support Africa and can Africa countries benefit? Yeah, well, definitely. The, and they did already. Uh, Actually, uh, we have funded, I think, a couple of projects in Tanzania for the first round uh, and the second round, which will uh, be released tomorrow, not to di disclose any, uh, any, any secret, but it's likely to fund projects located in Senegal, in Madagascar, in, uh, in Tanzania, in Morocco. So definitely Africa and, and of course, Namibia, which was also part of the first one. So as you can see, Africa is a big part of our efforts and uh, we are working uh, with uh, some big donors there as well, uh, notably the Bank of African Development and, uh, and, and some others. Uh, the, the World Bank has a great interest uh, and we feel like Africa may be the uh, very, very interesting. South Asia and Africa, I would say, because of the fast growing population there, have very high interest uh, in terms of uh, growing seaweed production. So we are very much involved there. Uh, there's a great project in Namibia, growing kelp. There's already a, a sizable industry in the East Africa, uh, notably in the island of Zanzibar. Uh, and, uh, and, and we know it's growing. I was invited yesterday uh, by, the, by the Kenya government uh, to give a presentation because they want to uh, they want to uh, to support for a bit further the seaweed industry. We know that South Africa is growing and Morocco is growing. So yeah, long story short, yes, there's a lot of interest in Africa. Uh, Senegal and, and West Africa is a bit more complicated, but still uh, some interesting place. You have some big upwelling area in Africa, which is very interesting because it means that you have a lot of nutrients offshore. So so very very interesting place, definitely. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I think many people will want to be in touch with you after this presentation and this session. Um, another question that I'd like to maybe ask a, a couple of panelists to respond to is, 
how how can we change um, seafood into the main food or main dishes? Um, and maybe uh, Shankuntala, if I could ask for, for, for you to speak to this first. Thank you, Julia. I was just posting um, uh, in the chat box about the, the, the very important use of seaweed in the complementary feeds for young children. As you know, the, in young children, we have the fastest growth rate and the needs for, for, for multiple nutrients is greatest in that time of growth and development. But because of all the values we have of seaweed being uh, dried, being stable, so easy to incorporate in, in dishes like porridges, and also with the high nutrient density, it's a perfect example of how we should be looking to use products in complementary feeding of young children. With respect to the whole, to the uh, to the whole diets and plates on the food, we, uh, you know, through the dishes that people that we that we um, that that people traditional dishes, we can find ways to add seaweed and dried seaweed as a, a, as an ingredient. In, in multiple dishes on the plate and in diets. Um, and this is important and perhaps easy in many cuisines to do because of you do not need to add that large quantities in order to get the nutritional benefits because with seaweeds being dried, you have already up-concentrated the nutrient density. And we've seen this in Bangladesh with very conservative um, uh, cuisines and very conservative um, patterns of, of, of meals that we have been able to add um, small amounts of seaweed, but yet big enough to give nutrient contributions to different family members and especially in young children. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shankuntala. And Dr. Kunda, would you like to add? Uh, thank you, thank you, Jilly. Uh, actually, uh, we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, introduce sweet made food to the people. This is very important in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, we are lagged behind the sweet culture and sweet food and. Uh, 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 the uh, food additives. So it needs to, uh, uh, it, it will add value if we uh, uh, circulate, if we uh, reach to the people with the uh, food, uh, seaweed uh, products, then it would be very, it will be very easy to um, uh, reach to the people and consume to the people. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that. And for our, our last comment, I, I, because I think, I mean, this is such a rich discussion. I wish we had another 90 minutes just for the question and answers. But unfortunately, we're going to have to move on. Um, Vansa, I think you have your hand up for the last word in the session. Yeah, no, just just to say uh, about uh, the, the, the food changes and the food habit changes. I mean, uh, food is fashion. And, uh, and, and, and if you have told my grandmother that I would pay a fortune eating a, a raw fish in Japanese restaurant, she would have cried and say, I'm crazy. Uh, so, I mean, we, it's changing very fast. And everywhere around the world, you see Japanese restaurants, the sushis became absolutely the new normal. Uh, and I think the same uh, will come uh, with, uh, with, uh, with seaweed. Uh, I'd like to, I mean, each time I'm asked, uh, like, oh, but seaweed is not good. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, have you tried to eat raw potatoes? It's not good either. Uh, and it might be dangerous for your health, so don't do that. So, uh, but once you learn to cook it, once you learn how to prepare it, I mean, it's delicious. And seaweed is the same. There's a wide variety of uh, seaweed, very, very different taste, new type of taste. I think for the chefs in the world, and we are working with chefs here in Portugal uh, for our uh, gathering tomorrow. I mean, it's a new gustative territory. It's a new, something new to discover. And I think that's just a question of education. Once again, look at the burgers. I mean, it was all new 50 years ago. It came from America, America and then boom, uh, the whole world is eating burgers now. So I think that's the same. We just need to tell the world that eating seaweed is good, is delicious, is good for the earth and good for the planet. Thank you so much for those inspiring closing words. Um, and 
Thank you for all of the um, uh, participants who posted questions. If, if your question was not answered, um, please, um, we will be taking all unanswered questions during the session. They will be being compiled and they'll be addressed as written remarks in the proceedings uh, and made available on the WorldFish website. So um, a little bit of patience, but you will find an answer to your question. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite another co-organizer to this side event, Esim Yassim Mohammed, the Interim Director General of WorldFish and the Acting Senior Director for Aquatic Food Systems with CGIAR, to deliver your remarks and to close this event. Esim, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Gillian um, and colleagues. Um, first and foremost, uh, let me start by recognizing the distinguished panelists today, um, including Kunda, my very good friend and colleague, Shakuntala, Vincent, Asad Zaman, Zakia, Jang Atati, Lim, and for the wonderful moderation by the very able Jilly as well. So thank you very much. Really inspiring conversation today. For me personally, um, very pleased to hear the very solid arguments from environmental, social, and economic points of view. For instance, from the environmental point of view, we've learned that um, seaweed, for instance, um, as feed additives, um, to cattle or livestock, for instance, and how they are able to reduce uh, methane, for instance, or their carbon sequestration abilities, particularly when one considers the soil and subsoil um, in seaweed farming, um, but also it provides food and shelter for juvenile fish as well and reduces eutrophication, the list is very, very long in terms of the, and the environmental arguments made for the seaweed um, farming, which is really, really encouraging. Um, having said that, also from an economic point of view, the global seaweed market is estimated at over $40 billion today, which is massive and is set to grow at an annual rate of up to 10% um, until 2030. But this leaves us with some critical questions to answer. What is the market share of small-scale aquatic food producers in this space? And how will this help the world fill some nutritional gaps? And how will this growing industry ensure a safe work environment for small scale producers has been some highlighting as well. But more importantly, we talked about market fragmentation as well, therefore how to enhance access to market both nationally and internationally to make sure um, aquatic food producers, particularly seaweed farmers, benefit from this wonderful opportunity that's ahead of us. Yesterday, I was having a conversation casually with a person I met here at the UN Ocean Conference, and that may, person made a very interesting statement saying, seaweed farming is still at its infancy, and it's at the level of that of agriculture 10 years ago, 10,000 years ago, rather. Right? Yes, indeed, it's still at infancy, still maybe the very uh, primitive stage. However, I strongly believe seaweed revolution doesn't need 10,000 years. We have huge opportunity for leapfrogging here by harnessing technological and digital innovations to signif significantly transform seaweed farming, processing, utilization, and consumption, and address the triple challenges of poverty, biodiversity loss, and climate change. However, all these points, you know, for us to, you know, embark in this journey to transform the seaweed um, farming sector uh, and to realize its benefits, its opportunities, and to harness those, we do need indeed favorable policy instruments. And I'm so pleased to hear the intervention by the very able, you know, that general from Indonesia as well, in terms of creating favorable uh, policy instruments uh, that incentivize the growth of the sector. But also we need significant investment flows in research and innovation, for instance, to enhance productivity or tackle disease, et cetera, et cetera, that we heard today. 
More importantly, we need partnerships. We need governments, the private sector, businesses, coastal communities, civil society groups, all playing their part in catalyzing and accelerating this transformation. And I'm so pleased to see this kind of platform that brings all these different stakeholders together. And as we embark on this journey to harness the opportunities and realize the ambition that's presented to us through the seaweed sector as well. Thank you very much all. Thank you, SM, for those inspirational words. Um, I would like to thank all our speakers for your contributions today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you attendees for actively participating in, in what has been an excellent panel, um, an excellent set of exchanges. And I'd like to thank the governments of Kenya and Portugal for hosting the UN Oceans Conference. Um, we invite you to subscribe to the World Fish newsletter to receive the event recording um, and other post-event materials. Um, and it, all it remains to me is to say thank you and to see you soon. Thank you.